Good afternoon and welcome to today's local government education webinar provided by University of Illinois Extension. My name is Lisa Merrifield and I'm a Community and Economic Development Specialist with, at the University of Illinois. Um, for sound quality, we've muted all microphones during this presentation. Use the chat space to send questions to the speaker. And if you have problems with connections, add those to the chat space as well. I will monitor that space and pose any comments or questions to our speaker as our presentation, at the end of our presentation. Today's webinar is part of our Sustainable Communities series, and it is on rural community water, understanding public and private drinking water sources. Today's uh, recorded webinar will be made available on our local government education website and our YouTube channel within the next week or so. Uh, our presenter is Steve Wilson. Steve is a groundwater hydrologist at the Illinois State Water Survey. His research is related to groundwater quality and quantity issues and drinking water. He also directs outreach programs that provide information to help private well owners and small water supply managers do their jobs better. At this time, I'll turn it over to Steve. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, you hear me okay? We can hear you. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Lisa said, I'm a groundwater hydrologist at the Water Survey. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, um, the Water Survey, which is on campus at the U of I, is a sister agency to our State Geological Survey and State Natural History Survey. Um, we're the only water survey in the country. Um, we perform uh, similar duties to the other surveys in that we do public outreach, public service, and applied research related to uh, groundwater, drinking water, uh, chemistry, atmospheric sciences, and um, surface water. And a little bit of background. Um, so the water survey started in 1895. This is a placard that's um, outside a noise lab at the U of I. And um, it was really started because of uh, water quality problems that were linked to, uh, to water, uh, namely uh, typhoid and cholera. And so uh, the water survey was established to investigate those things and try to uh, document um, where those problems might be, how to, you know, to look at public health and those issues, as it says here. And um, so what we are as an agency, if you will, or a department on campus is, as I mentioned, we do research public service and we collect data. Um, most of our uh, research is related to, that I'm involved in because I'm in the groundwater section, deals with looking at regional water supply issues or natural or man-made contaminant issues. And also we have a group that does groundwater modeling to try to um, help understand uh, how changes in pumping or additional uh, pumpage might affect uh, water availability. In our public service lab, uh, we have a public service group that does uh, lab services. Until 2006, any well owner in the, in the state could um, get a free water sample. We do things like the PwC is the private well class, which is actually a national program funded by US EPA that I'll talk about a little bit at the end uh, to provide uh, resources to private well owners. And we also do requests. Um, well owners can contact us, communities, engineers, um, planners all do contact us for, uh, for one reason, we house all the state's well logs. We have over 500,000 well logs in our files. We um, have an observational network and a net, another network called WARM, which is Weather and Atmospheric Monitoring. And we also have about 30,000 water quality samples, mostly groundwater, that are um, uh, in our files. So we have a lot of institutional history and a lot of data that uh, is unique, and it's the only place you can find it in, in the state or probably the country. And so um, that's our history. We're not well known for some reason. We do a bad job of marketing ourselves, I think. I know my uncle, who's a farmer over in Logan County, always asks me um, how my job's going at the water department. I think he thinks I work for the Champaign City Water Department still after all these years. Um, as an example, um, we're going through our records trying to digitize all of our old paper records. We have um, millions of pieces of paper in our files with, that go along with our well records. And uh, for the communities in the state, we, uh, that, especially that use groundwater, we have a historic record of every time they've installed a well, um, done any kind of treatment, anything that deals with our state EPA, uh, which you know formed uh, in about 1978. And this is an example of something that we've come across, which it's, an, it's amazing how much there is in our files. But this is an example from 1916. Um, this was a typhoid outbreak in Pena, Illinois. 
And uh, in the end, you can see in the middle there where it says Pena Ice Cream Company, um, that ended up being the source of uh, the typhoid outbreak back then. And there's a whole file and letters and everything else on this issue and that topic. Uh, and so there's just a wealth of information uh, and the data we've collected over the years, uh, as well as the things we still continue to do. Um, so today, that's just a little bit about the water survey. Uh, today we're going to talk about public versus private drinking water, water supplies in Illinois, um, groundwater and wells, water quality and quantity issues in Illinois, as well as in, at the end, uh, if there's time, some resources available uh, for both uh, private well owners and, uh, and also community uh, folks who are interested in um, how they can find out more about their own resource and what they need to know. And so um, moving on through that, I'm going to talk about public water supplies first. Uh, for everyone that's not aware, so uh, a public water supply is basically um, is any water supply that provides water to the public, whether that's a gas station or a community. Um, the regulator under the Safe Drinking Water Act, which Congress passed, um, and there was a lot of amendments in 2006, I believe, in 1996. So the US EPA is in charge of enforcing the Safe Drinking Water Act. And the way they do that is they give primacy, if you will, to um, an agency, a regulatory agency in each state and every state has its own primacy to enforce the Safe Drinking Water Act, but Wyoming, and that's, um, that authority is still with the regional EPA office um, out there. But in Illinois, it's the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency in Springfield. So their job, they have a compliance group, um, is to make sure that all the communities in Illinois um, meet the rules under the Safe Drinking Water Act so that all community water supplies provide safe water um, they have a licensed operator. I'm getting ahead of myself, some other things. And for non-community public water supplies, which would be those gas stations or daycares or schools that have their own water supply, um, the, uh, the authority for those is under the Illinois Department of Public Health. And that's done through an MOU between Illinois EPA and uh, IDPH, but they have a group at IDPH that manages things so a factory or a restaurant that has um, its own well, uh, like out in the country somewhere, um, those are regulated uh, because they do provide uh, water to the public. And so that's kind of the, the, the landscape, if you will. And as far as definitions, and I got these right off the EPA's webpage because uh, there's a lot of ways to say these things, but the bottom line is any, anyone who's providing water to either 15 connections, which would be 15 homes, or at least 25 people on average for at least 60 days a year is considered a public water system. And that's the overall umbrella. And underneath that, you have community water systems, which are for providing drinking water to the same population year round, residential, uh, which are most of our you know, communities. Mm -hmm. And then um, under non-community water supplies, there's two types. There's non-transient, which means it's the same people, at least 25 of those people, at least six months a year. So that would be a business or a school or a daycare. You know, your kids are in school for 180 days. So um, that just fits that definition. And so a lot of schools, maybe a school out in the country, the example that comes to mind to me is Olympia School District in Tazewell County. It's, uh, I think, five or six different communities that all have one school that's out in the country. They have their own water supply and they're considered a non-transient, non-community water system. And then uh, the quote lowest class of water system, if you will, are the transients, which have less rules they have to follow. Um, they still have to test and do some things. Um, but those would be, you know, rest areas, gas stations, um, things where it's not the same population. A restaurant out in the country where it's uh, different people drinking the water every day um, or less than 25. So a good example of that would be uh, a restaurant out in the middle of the country that has its own well. Uh, maybe they have 12 employees, and so that doesn't meet the 25 person a day every day, but they have more than 25 people there every day, and so um, they have at least 25 people a day for 60 days, and so they would be considered transient. And again, the, both not types of non-community system are um, managed or the authority for compliance falls under the Illinois Department of Public Health. So what all that really means is that if you um, are involved with one of those type of entities that you have responsibility um, because you're providing water to the public. For a community water supply, you know, you have to have a licensed operator, you have to test regularly, and there's a whole scheme for testing. 
based on what kind of contaminants you might have in your water, if there's natural occurring contaminants. Um, if you've tested a bunch of times and never found anything, then they release those uh, rules a little bit. Um, but it's all managed by um, the Illinois EPA. If you wanna change your system or add treatment, um, all those things go through EPA, uh, our state EPA, as well as they inspect uh, every public water supply or every community water supply every three years. It's called a sanitary survey. Those are available to you if you wanna learn more about your water system, if you're on a public or community water supply. And then on the non-community side, um, again, those are overseen by the Illinois Department of Public Health. They have uh, varying requirements, but um, it, again, it's still protective. They still have to test. Um, it's protective of public health. And uh, really the difference is when you think about it, if a community has a water supply for their residents, they're vested in providing water and that's what that water operator's job is. He's there for that community uh, 24 seven. His, you know, his responsibility is making sure all the people that live there have safe water. A non-community water supply um, to them, you know, they're not in the business of purveying water like a community water supply might be. They might be a daycare or a factory or a restaurant um, or a gas station. They're in the business to be a business. And the fact that they provide water means they also have to do these things. And so it's a little more challenging and uh, it's, a, it's a more of a moving target in some cases. But um, we're very fortunate in Illinois and the country that um, our rules have been such that we um, have very few incidents where there's been problems with uh, you know having safe water. Usually it's a you know, human error is uh, what ends up happening most of the time. Now, as far as private water supplies, and I'm just gonna really to just talk about wells today. Um, there are other types of, of private water supplies. You know, there are cisterns, there are springs. Um, in some cases, people may be using a pond. Um, and, you know, those, uh, those aren't regulated per se. Um, in Illinois, um, well drillers and well construction are regulated by the Department of Public Health so that a well has to meet current construction guidelines and uh, the rules for well construction. And also our county health departments inspect any new well that's drilled. Um, some of these laws have changed over the years and Illinois has had a law requiring drillers to submit their well logs and be licensed since 1968. But there are a lot of wells um, that are even older than that or um, that were put in and, and not filed with the state or the county. And so um, there's two things. One, there are a lot of wells that don't meet those codes because they were installed before the code was available and uh, all the wells have been grandfathered in. And two, once a well's installed, there's no more requirements for testing, maintenance, anything. It all falls on uh, the well owner to make sure they're uh, providing safe water. And that's, you know, that's the business I'm in as far as um, uh, the work I do for our private well program is to help well owners understand that responsibility and what they need to do. And this next slide is one that I show uh, almost every presentation I give. And through our private well program, we do webinars every month for well owners all around the country. But you need to understand they're not regulated. So you're responsible as a well owner to make sure your water's safe and maintained. Um, you can't go by, by color, odor, or taste. Um, water can look and taste the best uh, of as any in the world, but that doesn't mean that you don't have contaminants in it. You can't see arsenic in groundwater. Uh, it's just the way it is. Um, certainly if it does have a color or odor or smell um, or taste, um, it, it could mean something and that's a reason to be concerned, but you can't go by the fact that it doesn't have those things. And the last thing I'll say is, so I grew up on an old hand dug well on a small hog farm in central Illinois. Um, and uh, our well was 14 foot deep. And uh, when it rained really hard, our water was cloudy. And so it wasn't safe or protective, but that's the way I grew up. And uh, now I live in uh, Savoy, south of Champaign. And uh, the 40 to $60 a month I pay to my community water system, that spreads um, that cost over the 150,000 residents here for sampling maintaining our infrastructure, um, maintenance of our treatment equipment, and all the sampling and, and, and those things that are done to make sure, uh, paying for a licensed operator and staff to make sure that our water is safe. So when I turn on my tap, I know um, the water that I'm drinking isn't uh, gonna be dangerous or harmful to me. And if you're a well owner, all of that is your responsibility. And uh, it's really surprising um, how many people don't understand that responsibility 
but a lot of people really don't. Um, they've never tested um, a lot of things, which is why um, you know our program is is pretty active and, and actually fairly successful because there's a lot people can learn about their wells they didn't realize uh, they need to know. So a little bit of a, ge a geology lesson. Uh, these are all, everyone here is from Illinois, and uh, you know at the State Water Survey and State Geological Survey we work together on a lot of groundwater issues. And so um, a million years ago, and I am not a geologist, I'll say that up front, um, but a million years ago, bedrock was land surface. So here in Champaign, it, you have to drill down three to 400 feet uh, in some places to get to bedrock, and everything above the bedrock is all that was deposited by glaciers. So um, this is what our landscape looked like a million years ago. There was a Mahomet Tays River that came all the way from West Virginia on the west, or on the east, uh, below that, in, that isn't labeled is the Wabash Valley, but um, the ancient Mississippi actually ran through uh, and connected just north of Peoria where the Illinois is today. And it was the old Iowa River that doesn't exist anymore. Um, that was the other uh, uh, river, if you will, that was cut into bedrock and where drainage after rain, storms and all that stuff flowed. So you can see this is the way our major river systems looked then. So, so then, um, going from left to right, so we have our river system, then a glacier comes through, it basically uh, sealed off the Mississippi um, up by the Quad Cities and turned it. And so that's why we get the shape we see today. Um, and we know this because we can look at the geology and see the bedrock surface and see where the elevation's higher and lower. And uh, we see these, uh, these cutouts in the bedrock. But you can see how that happened. There's been multiple glaciations in Illinois. And so we see, um, you know, there's a lot of changes uh, through geologic time in how our, um, how our water systems here, uh, surface water systems particularly. And all the sand and gravel aquifers in Illinois are all from this glacial material that was deposited. So if you look at, um, this is from the geo survey, which I forgot to put a reference on the bottom, I apologize. Um, so this is a regional bedrock topography meaning uh, all the lighter areas and uh, the really light area in the central left side of Illinois there is Mason County, which those of you that are familiar with Mason County know it's almost all sand and gravel, um, a lot of irrigation. And that's because that's where that glacial sand was deposited. It also ended up being um, a place for all the glaciers when they melted, all the meltwaters went through that area. But you can see that hook from up by the Quad Cities in northeastern, northwestern Illinois that comes down through and through Mason County where the Illinois is today. And uh, you know that's, that's the ancient Mississippi. But this is an elevation map. So basically it's showing you the lowest areas and those are the places where the sand is the thickest. And so um, for instance, over in Champaign County, we're one of those light areas and uh, we've got uh, some fairly thick Muhammad Aquifer and uh, Champaign, Ford, Vermilion, uh, counties. So um, that's kind of the backdrop for all this stuff. And so what we have today, when we look at a map, um, you know, the water surveys mapped all the sand and gravel aquifers, which are the ones that sit on top of bedrock. Um, it's unconsolidated sand, silt, and clay that was left by the glaciers. And these are our major sand and gravel aquifers. And, uh, you know, it makes sense. They're either in river valleys, like along the Mississippi, or they're in old bedrock valleys that were river valleys before the glaciers came. And so that's where most of our sand and gravel has been deposited. And uh, just like if, um, you know, I grew up on a small creek, Salt Creek in Logan County, and um, you know, all the sandbars that are there, we used to ride our horses up and down uh, our creek. And uh, that's what those are. They're just bigger deposits because you know, you're melting a thousand feet of uh, ice when the glaciers melted. And so that deposited all that sand and that's what we use as a water source today. So um, it's not that simple though. Um, this is a cross section and all the blue are the different aquifers. And so the Mahama aquifer, which I mentioned um, in let's say, uh, it goes from Champaign County all the way over to uh, the Illinois River in Mason County. Um, this is uh, an area where there's been three sets of glaciers come through. Um, and so each of those squiggly vertical lines are an organic layer where that was land surface at one point. And uh, so you can see there was a, there's two buried ones and then there's one which is the current land surface. 
and uh, all the blue are the different sand and gravel units that have been deposited. So we did a large research study over in McLean, Tazewell, and Logan County uh, in the 90s to look at um, the availability of water in the Muhammad Aquifer, and we uncovered a lot of this complexity that wasn't really realized until uh, until you drill a well, you don't know what you're going to find. Is the bottom line, but um, you know these small gravel units can be used for a private well, as we've demonstrated here on this diagram, but for a larger water supply for a public well or for a, you know, a large uh, like for irrigation wells over in Mason County, they're down in the Muhammad because it can provide you know thousands of gallons a minute uh, sustainably. So. Um, so it is complicated, our glacial geology is, but it's, um, you know, it also provides, uh, explains how water moves through our system and, you know, the Muhammad ends up discharging into the Illinois River, um, which, so it's part of the hydrologic cycle and uh, where some of the rivers, like here, this shows the Mackinac, but the Sangamon River over here in, uh, near Allerton Park in, in Pyatt County, um, actually is connected all the way to the Muhammad Aquifer. There's all the sand units kind of lined up and they all are connected. And so um, we see uh, high capacity pumpage affecting water levels. And then like the drought in 88, we saw the same and go dry in that area because the Oxford, uh, the water level in the Oxford lowered enough that it, uh, you know, water is discharging down into the ground. Um, so in Illinois, we really have three types of aquifers. Uh, we have, we have uh, sand and gravel, which is over on the right. That's the map I just showed you. We also have shallow bedrock, so right at the surface, it's usually, um, it can be anything, but a lot of it's dolomitic limestone, um, and it typically has uh, fractures that hold water. So it's almost, instead of being uh, water existing in the sand grains of a sand and gravel aquifer, it's almost like pipe flow, where it exists in the fractures, and then you drill a well and hit one of those fractures, you have water, and if you miss all the fractures, you don't. Um, we also have deep bedrock, which uh, that's what the Chicago area was using for many years. And uh, this diagram here on the left shows, says high TDS, total dissolved solids. Um, that aquifer actually goes through the entire state, but further south of that line where it turns to uh, clear or white, um, the total dissolved solids, which is a measure of you know, it's salt water, is high enough that um, it's not really used as a water source. And so one of the issues we have today is that uh, because of pumpage uh, in the northern part of the state and out of this deep aquifer, we're starting to see a migration of the higher TDS water towards the north. And eventually, you know, it may take a very long time, but if we continue pumping like we are, we may see issues uh, with the deep sandstone aquifer um, in northern Illinois. But um, you'll notice that um, the southern part of the state, you don't see a lot of aquifers. They're usually along river valleys uh, in the sand and gravels that are part of the river system. And uh, that's just because of the high TDS and the, the shallow dolomite uh, doesn't really exist in all those places. Or again, I'm not a geologist, I might've just misspoke, but um, it certainly doesn't exist as a water supply. And so in the Southern part of the state, we rely much more on surface water systems. And I'm not gonna talk a lot about that because um, I'm not a surface water hydrologist, but I did wanna show you a map one of our staff put together, Dan Hadley, here in the groundwater section, developed a statewide map showing where all the water uh, is distributed in the state. So as um, I didn't put the whole map up here, but I just showed as an example, Wren Lake provides water to communities in 13 counties in Southern Illinois. And that again is because there's not a lot of groundwater available. So they sell to 40 different communities, as it says here, and they also um, sell water as far away as 40 miles away. And we're starting to see more of that with some rural water districts. But um, you know, we have other areas of the state, like in Pyatt County, where they're putting in rural water districts because um, you need a uh, source that's reliable. And in areas where it becomes more karst like, like in Pyatt County, um, a lot of the private wells end up being contaminated with E. coli or coliform um, because of sinkholes and just the way surface water can get down into the uh, aquifer or into the shallow uh, bedrock. So regional water supplies like this, um, we, have, we have a number of them, and this is just the largest one. And so I wanted to show that as an example, but we have a map like this of the entire state that shows how all the water is distributed from what sources. Um, it's one of the things that Dan developed as part of our water supply planning work. Um, yeah, so 
um, as far as contaminants, uh, you know, the things, and this is from Walt Kelly, who's um, my boss and also a, a geochemist. Um, he does a lot of work looking at natural and uh, man-made contaminants. And so, you know, the big issues in Illinois tend to be arsenic, radium, barium, and uh, the deep bedrock that total dissolved solids that I mentioned, salt water. And then um, the things we see uh, that are more human induced tend to be nitrate and also uh, salt water, but not what you think of from road salt. So I'm only going to show a couple examples of that here, but um, uh, here's arsenic in Illinois. So in 2006, the arsenic rule changed for the Safe Drinking Water Act from 50 to 10. So before that, when it was 50, these are the communities that their raw water had issues being above 50 milligrams per liter of arsenic, which again, now the standard's 10. But when they changed the rule and we looked at um, natural water quality in uh, the wells and uh, community water supplies in Illinois, now all of a sudden we have a lot more wells um, that have had issues. So they either add treatment or find a different way um, to remove that arsenic so the water they're providing to all their customers is below 10. And uh, so that's what's happened. And uh, on the man-made side, I'll, I'm going to show you a couple figures here. Um, this is a map of chlorides in Illinois. The two on the right are groundwater. The middle one is sand and gravel uh, aquifers. And the one on the far right is the deep bedrock aquifer. And as I mentioned, it's very high in chloride the further you go south. But where we have samples from community wells, you can see that further, uh, the southern part of that is still fairly high and it gets lower as you move north. Where with the sand and gravel aquifers, it's all over the map. The one on the left, however, are stream samples. So we're seeing chlorides up in the Chicago area um, as high as 100 milligrams per liter or higher. And so, um, you know, that's a problem. And it lends to the urbanization of the area and road salt issues. And uh, as another example, these are some shallow wells and these are the communities and the actual water samples from them. And you can see how that's changed over time with some of these communities and the amount of chloride in their, uh, in their wells has gone up. And so it's a real issue. Um, it's something that we're looking into because, you know, if the chlorides and other things get high enough in those shallow aquifers, then they won't be available for use, so they'll have to be treated in order to provide uh, adequate water supply. And the same thing with nitrate. Um, obviously, we're an agricultural state. Um, you know, I grew up not too far from Mount Pulaski. Uh, it's a very highly uh, agricultural area, and, you know, we grew, I grew up on a hog farm, so uh, a lot of livestock. I know there's not as much as there used to be out there, but um, you can see how nitrates increased in some of these wells where there's long-term data uh, to show those values. And uh, yeah, again, this is work my, my boss, Walt Kelly, has uh, done over the years here working at the survey. So, you know, the message is whether you're in a community or you're a private well owner, you need to know what your water quality is. So the message is to sample if you're a private well owner. Um, you need to understand what could be there. So um, looking at maps where we um, are talking to the surveys or, or your county health department, about um, what kind of natural occurring contaminants you might have. I know there's several I didn't even get into. Um, and knowing what those risks might be, other water samples that might be in the area, uh, the message is to really be inquisitive and ask. You can either ask us, you can ask a public health professional, uh, you can ask uh, your state EPA or IDPH, and uh, there, we're all here really to help you understand um, your water supply and any water quality concerns you might have. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about private wells because um, that's a big issue in Illinois. Um, we have well logs for about 500,000 wells. We estimate there's between 800,000 and a million private wells actually in use in Illinois. And these are really the issues. They're pretty simple when it comes down to it. It's really about protecting public health and protecting source water. You know, abandoned wells can be a way for people to dump things and it gets into an aquifer and it can contaminate your neighbor's well or whatever. But what we found through our private well program is that uh, well owners just don't understand their wells very much. They think they're safe. As an example, when I was a kid, my dad always swore our well water was better than city water because we didn't put chemicals in it like cities do. Not understanding that, you know, adding chlorine and adding other things that need to be added um, are there to help protect us. Um, and the best example of that is um, I drank that water my whole life. I went to college to the U of I was gone for three months drinking city water that was chlorinated. When I came home, I couldn't drink our well water anymore. 
uh, the bacteria in my stomach that I was used to were gone and, um, you know, made me sick. So um, it is really about well owner education. And if you work with private well owners or you are a private well owner, um, the message is to get people informed and help them understand. And I'll explain that at the end how to do that. Um, also, the other issue is most of our problems come from poor well construction. And these are usually older wells, like the one I grew up on, where they're not protective, surface water can get in, um, or they're, they weren't put in the right location. Ours is in a ravine, so it could get more water. Uh, that's where all the runoff goes, those sorts of things. And it's about understanding why a well needs to be placed in a protective place. That's why we have well construction uh, guidelines and code now, and uh, it's about understanding all those issues. Um, the other issue we have with well owners is they're, they're really everyone. They come from every social, economic, and education class. Some people have been on a family farm for um, their entire life, their dad's entire life, and their grandpa's entire life. Others just move out to the country because they wanted a nice house out in the country and they know nothing about geology, groundwater, or their well. So um, I grew up in a very rural area, but how many of you knew there were 3,500 private wells in Cook County? Um, most people, especially Illinoisans, um, are really surprised by that. This is from the GeoSurveys uh, uh, website where they, you can see all the wells in an area. And on the left is just a, a bigger map showing um, the Chicago area. And this is near the DuPage Cook County line. And on the right is a blow up. I had to go uh, zoom in to get the wells to show up. And this well that I'm highlighting um, is really just south of O'Hare. It's just north of Butler National Golf Course. It's in a very urban area. But what's happened is all these communities up there, all of their municipal boundaries don't match up. And some of them are unincorporated. And there they have private wells in their own septic. So the issues these folks have are much different than the issue I had growing up, where they're more concerned about industrial contaminants or road salt or some of those other things. You know, I grew up near Middletown, Illinois. That blue kind of a circle is my old dug well. And, um, you know, there's only, there's only three wells listed there in the entire section, um, but our well was hand dug in 1933. It's uncemented brick. We would run out of water if I left a hose in the horse tank during the summer. We might not have water for three days. Um, anybody remembers in 1976, I was a kid. We had uh, an ice storm uh, right before Easter. We were without power for seven days. So it's a much different problem, um, but they're all well owner problems we need to deal with. And that's what makes it so complicated as an educator or an outreach person to actually uh, provide benefit to well owners because everyone's unique. Everyone has their own story. Um, a little bit about wells. So there's really three types of wells. There are dug and bored wells. Those are large diameter wells that are meant to act like a cistern where you don't really have an aquifer. So water seeps in slowly most of the time from the water table or they're very old like the old dug well I grew up on. For driven or drilled wells, they're usually they're either in sand and gravel, which means they have a screen or they're in bedrock, which means they're open hole once you get into the, um, into the rock. So in some cases you may have several choices based on your location. In other cases, you only have one choice and the water quality may be terrible. Um, you know, they may have high sulfur or some other thing, but you need to understand those differences. And so um, this is a, a rig drilling a, a, a board well. So it's a three foot diameter well. You can see that below the, behind the back tires of that rig. Um, I always think this photo's um, kind of uh, misplaced because it looks to me like they're putting a, a dug well in a, or a board well in a bean field. And that's uh, just not a great idea. Um, a dug well or bored well by definition is getting water from near the water table, um, so near the surface, and uh, putting it in the middle of a field doesn't seem like the best place, but maybe that's all they have. Um, these are all examples of, of bored or dug wells. The one on the upper left is a well we measured uh, as part of a dug and bored well study, but all of these are three foot diameter large wells uh, or bigger um, once you get down into the well. And I'll show you an example, the one on the right and the bottom one on the left. Um, the one, uh, the three foot one with the concrete pad is like the example here on the uh, left, where the concrete towel goes all the way up to the surface and there's a concrete pad on top, the pumps down in the uh, well. Each of those perforations or where those uh, tile fit together, water can seep in. And the other example where it looks just like a regular drilled well is because they put clean earth fill up the upper 10 feet to try to protect a little bit from the surface and the actual board well part uh, doesn't start until below 10 feet. So 
um, just as an example. So sand and gravel wells, they're, they, they're finished so that the bottom of the well is in sand and gravel that's saturated. So this is a well screen and it's sized based on the size of the sand grains in the aquifer. Water can come in, but the sand can't. So the, the deal with a sand and gravel well and the thing to remember is whatever your length of screen is, that's the only place water's coming in the well. If you have a 200 foot sand and gravel well with an, a six foot screen on the bottom, then you're only getting water from 194 to 200 feet below land surface. That's a good thing. Um, the farther from surface, usually the less risk you have of surface contaminants. Um, these, the, the rest of that well is either gonna be PVC or steel. And again, that size of the screen is based on the sand grains. So a bedrock well uh, is different in that usually you only have casing until you get 10 to 20 feet into the bedrock. And you can see that on the diagram just right of the well casing, 10 to 20 feet of casing into bedrock. Below that, it's not, there's no casing. The bedrock itself acts as the casing. And the point of that is because you're trying to hit fractures. The water only comes in the well from cracks in the rock. So if you don't hit any cracks or fissures, um, you're not gonna have much water. And what that also means though, is depending on the direction of the cracks, uh, those cracks could go right back up towards the surface. They could go for only, uh, they could go for a long way. And it may, if you only have one fracture that you're getting all your water from, then wherever that water is getting in that fracture, even if it's five miles away and it's at the surface, is gonna affect your water quality. So the bottom line is the third bullet here, um, bedrock wells can be influenced over larger distances. It doesn't mean they will be, but they can be. Um, I noticed in our, uh, the startup thing, we talked about septic systems. I know um, I didn't really have time to talk about those. So all I'm gonna say about septic systems is they have to be maintained. Um, I have well owners tell me all the time, how do I find my septic tank? If you don't know where your septic tank is, um, you've got a problem because um, it could be close to your well. It shouldn't be. Uh, depends on how old it is, but it also has to be maintained just like your well does um, or it's not going to function properly. You know, a septic tank works by um, everything from your house coming into it. The solids fall to the bottom. Uh, some of the solids float on top, but they're kept from getting into the drain field. And there's bacteria in there that come from our bodies that break all that stuff down. If you're not following good maintenance and you're not pumping it, eventually that thing's gonna fill up and your tank's gonna get plugged or your drain field's gonna get plugged. And then when that happens, it's gonna come up out of the ground or worse yet, back up into your house. So my message really for about septic systems is one, you need to know where it is to make sure it's not close to your well. Um, and if you sample, uh, that'll tell you if, if you have a problem, um, or could be a problem, uh, you might be contaminating your own well supply but also you have to maintain it to make sure that uh, you're taking care of it properly and it doesn't eventually uh, have to be fixed. So as far as resources, I wanna quickly talk about those. Um, for public water systems, the best source of information on water quality especially is the Illinois EPA. You know, they, they're in charge of um, compliance for those systems. They license the operators, they make sure they're trained they do all those things. They also have a, a website where data is available called the Drinking Water Watch page. And uh, on that page, you can find information about any public water supply in the state. Uh, in, I, well, for sure, any community water supply. Um, and that's all I've ever used it for. So um, I'm not gonna talk about water supply planning. I meant to put a slide in about um, our program here on all the water supply planning efforts. You know, we've learned things like uh, in the deep sandstone aquifer in the Chicago area, Joliet's probably the biggest pumper. Um, there, um, before Lake, Lake Michigan water was available, uh, they were taking more out of the deep sandstone overall in the Chicago area, not just Joliet, than was really available. So they lowered the water levels in the deep sandstone almost a thousand feet. When they went to Lake Michigan water, that helped a lot, but now we're seeing Chicago area grow so much that they're going back to some of that sandstone and it probably isn't sustainable long-term. So at some point in the future, the Chicago area is gonna have a hard time getting enough water because they can't take any more out of Lake Michigan. And that's all I'll say there. You can go to our water supply planning page and see a lot of information about that. And then wateroperator.org water is a site that I maintain and it's a national program funded by US EPA to provide support to water and wastewater operators. And then on the private well side, um, I'm gonna show you quickly how to use Illwater, which is the ISGS 
a record search program you can find any well log in the state and then our private well class program is um, how I'm going to finish this up. So if you Google Illinois EPA Drinking Water Watch, you get to this page, you click on Launch Website, and it takes you to this um, really nice tool they've developed where if you know your water system's number, your official number with EPA, um, you can use that. Um, you can also search by and sort by all these other things. Um, most people are going to click on search for water systems if they want to know what's on there, um, or you can search, click on the county map and pull that up. Um, I clicked on search for water systems, and there's their water system number on the left, but it's, this is alphabetical. It lists, there's 1,754 public water systems in the state, and they're all listed here. And if you click on that, you can get to the data. Um, every sampling result they have, you know, all the, they're, they're required to sample, um, either monthly or every three months, depending on the contaminant, and all that information is made publicly available. So you as a um, resident of that community um, can find those, uh, that information. And so it's really a powerful tool. Um, I recommend you take a look. You can find out a lot of things about your water supply through it, and that's the whole idea. Um, Wateroperator.org is, again, the site I maintain. Uh, it's really meant for water and wastewater operators. That's our focus. So when it says search the calendar, you can go in and find every training that's available for a water or wastewater operator anywhere in the country. Um, but you'd search by Illinois and you can narrow that down to a calendar that shows all the Illinois events and those things. But we also have a, a set of resources. We link to over 18,000 documents that are related to water and wastewater. And so there's also things, I know some of this is about communities and boards and mayors, uh, our talk today I mean, and so um, I just did a quick search where I, in the keyword filter over on the uh, right side, I typed in board training, and there are 18 documents available um, from different groups on um, board training that are related to board training in some way. And uh, it shows a couple of these that are uh, videos, number two and number three. So I went to type equals videos, and nine of these are videos that you can watch just about that topic. Um, instead of using type, if you clicked on category, there's 32 categories listed there that are related to water and wastewater. All the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act contaminants, like you know, there's one on groundwater, there's one on um, disinfection, and uh, there, again, we linked over 18,000 documents here. Every one, like number two here, it, it's got a link to uh, their board management training, which is a requirement in Mississippi. They have to have six hours of training if you're a board member for a community. Um, and also, uh, then it tells you what's there. So we've tried to make this uh, added value added, so it provides information uh, to you as a um, as a board member, as a you know decision maker in your community. Um, this is Illwater I mentioned. If you go to the state geological's website and just look for Illinois Water Well Interactive Map, um, it's on the right side. You click on the interactive map, and it brings up. Um, and when you zoom in, it brings up all the wells that are there. You can see how many wells are drilled. This is basically Champaign County. Um, you can see uh, right where the, the dark color there is the aquifer, uh, the Muhammad aquifer, and where the extent of that is. And so as we zoom in here, we can click on a well, and you can see there's a little arrow there that shows this is a well just on the west side of Willard Airport, and it gives you some information. If I click on the API number, it gives me a log. So I can see how deep they drilled, um, where the, you know, um, and other information about that. You can also, this is a different log. Um, we've, we're in the process of linking all the water surveys, uh, scans of the original well logs to these generated logs that the GeoSurvey has. And so in this particular instance, there's three different water survey documents available that go along with this well. And so when you click on that, you can see what the driller actually submitted. Uh, the well was completed in 1959, you know, it's 169 feet deep, all those things. So there's a lot of value in that. If you're a well owner, um, if we have your log, you can find it here. And that's uh, the bottom line. And that's great information to have to understand um, whether you have a sand and gravel well or a bedrock well, you know, it tells you. Uh, this is actually, um, originally they put it in a concrete pit, 50 inch diameter, and then it's a four inch well from, uh, or it's a, I'm sorry here, two and a half inch diameter. Uh, so it's a really small well because uh, it's older, down to 162. Uh, so the private well class I mentioned, um, it's called privatewellclass.org. It's a website. It's got a 10 lesson class to help you understand how to, how to 
manage your well. And we really recommend uh, folks take it. We've had over 6,500 people around the country take it in the last four years. And you just click on learn by email or take our free class and it takes you to this page and you sign up with your email address, your first name and what state you live in. Um, and that's really so we can tell EPA that um, we have people from all over the country taking it. And then, um, yeah, it, it walks you through uh, once a week for, um, I'm gonna go back, once a week for 10 weeks, you get a PDF emailed to you. So it's self-paced, you're on your own to actually go through it, but it's really valuable. It walks you through um, how water gets in your well, the hydrologic cycle, why you need to be concerned, um, how to inspect the top of your well, um, common problems people have, um, what to do if you need treatment and why you should sample. So it's a, a really useful tool. And again, it's all free and it's all self-paced. Um, we do webinars every month. So just this August, we did one on what well owners need to know about lead. We actually had an expert from Virginia Tech come and uh, do most of the presentation, but it's really focused on private well issues and what you need to know about your premise plumbing and uh, how little solder or brass it takes to actually leach lead if, if your water quality is of a certain type. And so really useful information. And along with this, we've created some support pages like this lead and drinking water page that uh, uh, gives you tools to go and look at like CDC and EPA's websites uh, to find more information, you know, kind of the official, here's, here's what you need to know about lead type stuff. So, um, and along with that on our webpage, we have uh, these short videos. Why does my well keep losing pressure? So we have a video that just describes how a pressure tank works and it's had over 200,000 hits in about two years. And what we've learned from that is that there's a lot of, not a lot of information out there about uh, septic or about pressure tanks and pressure issues. And also that there's a lot of people who have pressure problems that are on private wells. And so this walks you through, you know, what your pressure switch is and what your pressure gauge is. Um, all those sorts of, uh, it's like four to six minutes long. Um, and if you're a professional who works with well owners, we put on a conference here in Illinois uh, in Champaign last May in 2017, and we had 26 speakers, it was two and a half days. And one of the main things we were trying to do is reach county and local health department sanitarians, because that's the first line. When people have a problem with their well, that's usually who they go to first. So we recorded all, the, all 26 presentations. They're 30 minutes long. Um, we put them on our webpage and on YouTube. They're all freely available. And so if you go to our website and, and under webinars and events, if you scroll over that, you'll see one that says private well conference and click on it. It takes you to a page similar to this. We've changed it now because we're gonna put on another conference, but you can get to all 26 of those presentations and they're all by practitioners about uh, real private well issues. It's not theoretical, it's not really research oriented. It's meant to be things, um, we put on a conference trying to uh, educate practitioners on things that would help them do their jobs better and work with well owners. So um, that's available to you and it's all free. We also developed this brochure. It's a trifold and we've printed them ourselves. We give them out for free. Um, we've given out over 40,000 of them to uh, about 300 organizations that are putting these out uh, to well owners they work with. We left a space here between private well class and RCAP. You can put your own label on it if you want to. Um, we're not trying to, uh, we're trying to work with folks, not um, just do our own program. And on the inside, it basically says, here's why you need to test your water. Here's the best practices you need to follow. And here's why you need to learn how your well works. And um, you know, it's been very popular. And if anyone's interested in that, you can follow up and let us know. We'd be glad to send you some of those uh, to hand out. Um, it's also in Spanish. Um, matter of fact, we have our entire class in Spanish as a separate website site. So if you work with folks who are uh, native Spanish speakers and prefer material that way, we've got the entire thing done in Spanish. And um, you know, that's all the time I have. I took a little more than I was supposed to. So um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Lisa. All right, thank you so much, Steve, that was great. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Uh, we have one right now, and that question is, how often should a homeowner actually test their private well water? Um, sorry, we got a piece of ice. <laughs> uh, so what we recommend, and if you go on our website, all of our webinars we do have been recorded, and there's several that are just geared towards well owners and things they need to do for best practices. But we recommend you sample for nitrate and coliform every year. 
not because they're much more of a risk, but because they're an indicator that there's a pathway into your well. So you shouldn't have high nitrate or coliform in your well. And matter of fact, neither one will necessarily make you sick. Um, you know, nitrate's bad for babies for sure. There's, you know, there's arguments out there about whether a nitrate is bad for us as adults. Um, but you should sample for coliform and nitrate just because it means that if it's in there, then there's pathways for other things to get in there that might be worse. So um, that's just a way to understand if you're well, because you know, well casings can be breached or cracked. Um, we've seen tree roots get around well casings, especially PVC and crack it. And then you see coliform all the time. Um, and then we have a list of constituents that we recommend use test for every three to five years. You know, metals, inorganics, um, and I don't have that in front of me, but um, I can certainly send it to you. You can uh, look at our webinars. Um, that are recorded and find that information. And the idea there is that some of those things shouldn't change. Your pH should be, if it's seven and a half today, it should be seven and a half in five years. Um, same with arsenic. If your arsenic is only at three parts per billion today, in six or in, in five years, it shouldn't be 40. Uh, we see groundwater is pretty consistent. Now a shallower well will have a little more variability, but it's just a good way to understand. And then you can take that information to a qualified person um, if it's a public health issue, you take it to your county health department. If it's an understanding of just the general water chemistry, you can come to our lab uh, and, and our folks can help. Um, but yeah, it's, that's basically um, what we recommend for testing. And you know, two thirds of well owners have never tested their well, which is really a concern. And that's one of the big missions I'd say we have is to help people understand that it's really worth their time uh, to test. Perfect, thank you. Um, our second question is about um, the, the, the wells themselves, and it says, um, so to clarify, the well depends on the soil to filter the water before it gets into the, into the pipeline? Well, it, it, I mean, it really depends. Um, you know, things like arsenic is a naturally occurring contaminant. So the Muhammad Aquifer, especially in areas like Tazewell County, we see a lot of arsenic. It's the, the ground, it's in the, uh, it's in the grains of the aquifer itself, of the sand and gravel. There's a, there's a type of mineral called uh, pyrite, which there's an arsenio pyrite where arsenic is bound to it. And it really depends on how reducing the chemistry is of the water, whether it gets released or not. And so it, um, certainly the soil and uh, the deeper your well is, it means you're filtering stuff that might come from the surface but they're also natural occurring things that may just be there. And uh, you know, there's, it's not gonna get filtered out per se. And there's some things that just don't get filtered. I just had a discussion with a guy talking about atrazine and you know, they used to believe that you know, it's got a certain half-life and so it would be gone after a certain amount of time. But what really happens is if it gets in an anaerobic uh, situation in the ground where it's not getting any air, it breaks down 10 times slower. I mean, that's just an example. I'm just saying a lot slower. Um, and so it can, they find atrazine still, even places that haven't used it for many years sometimes when it's an anaerobic environment. Okay. Um, one more question, it looks like. So you, it looked like there were some tools for boards to learn about their, the public water supplies, but are there, are, are there any things beyond the, um, the, getting the brochure that you would recommend uh, local governments do to help their their rural citizens who have private wells maintain those and learn about them? You know, um, we've developed our program so that it's fairly comprehensive. Um, we have well owners who attend every one of our webinars, even if they've attended them in the past. Um, and it's also a place you can ask questions. And so I would say going through those webinars or attending the ones we have coming up um, where you can ask your own questions are, are, are good ways. Um, Every well owner, in my opinion, uh, should take our private well class. It's free, you just have to read it. And um, it gives you a good set of basic uh, instructions and advice and information to help you understand why you need to understand your well log, for instance, and what type of well you have, and what the geology is in your area, and, and who you can talk to, uh, whether it's your county health department or your extension agent or uh, your stormwater conservation district. You know, different folks have uh, information that's available to you. And, you know, just like the State Water Survey and State Geological Survey, if you want to know about your geology or your drinking water quality, 
you should call those folks. You should call all of us because um, we're here to help you and um, we welcome that sort of thing. And a lot of people just are afraid to call, just like I have a lot of well owners who tell me that they don't wanna call their county health department because what if they tell me I can't use my well? Well, in Illinois, no county that I know of has rules and I know the state doesn't. No one can tell you to stop drinking your water. Um, you know, they or we may recommend you don't drink your water. Um, I ran across a home that had six kids and they had 250 ppb of arsenic in their drinking water, in their well water, which the standard is 10. Um, so we certainly don't recommend, it's probably a health risk to at least some of those kids uh, to do that, but no one can tell you you can't. And I certainly run across people who tell me just that. I've drank this my whole life. My grandpa lived to be 90. You know, I don't, it's not harmful. And if that's their opinion, it's their right. Um, but um, the more informed you are, uh, our class is meant to provide all of that material. So it gives you, so you can ask better questions, you know who to contact. Um, not only are there the lessons, but there's the videos and, um, you know, the webinars that we do. And uh, our webinars are unique in that when you sign up for one of our webinars, we give you a chance then to ask questions. So we spend, my boss and I and the head of our lab, we spend a, a couple days before each webinar trying to answer 15 or 20 of those questions and putting them on the slides. So at the end of the presentation, um, we answer those questions first. And sometimes we'll have 150 or 200 questions, which we obviously can't answer. But um, each of those recordings has all of those answers and questions in it. So they're really valuable, especially the last half of those uh, to answer a lot of common questions that people have about wells. Great, sounds like a great resource. Um, I think that about concludes our program. Steve, thank you so much and thank you for all of our participants today. Uh, a video recording of the webinar will be available on the local government education website soon. Um, and we hope you will all join us next month when we'll talk about stormwater management. Our speakers include both an engineer who can talk about what to do with stormwater and an economist who can talk about the, the financial reasons and realities of, of various, of letting problems fester or for solving those problems. So I hope you'll join us. I believe that's December 6th, but we'll get out information with um, on that soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.